Oh, I didn't know if you were talking about yourself. We're going to get started this morning, and uh, so good to have each of you with us on this beautiful morning. I uh, just want to start out with a quick announcement, a few quick announcements. Uh, one of those would be that our teens are having their own time this morning. We don't normally do that during a Sunday service, but uh, with everything going on, they haven't been able to meet too much, and so if you're a teen and you'd like to go uh, be with them back in the youth room, one of our ushers could take you if you don't know where that is, and uh, we'd love to have you back with them. Um, our community groups... We start this uh, tonight at 5 o'clock, and we do have child care uh, for those of you who might be new. Uh, there are a few different things that, are, that we're doing with our child care. We're going to use our check-in system, and so we're going to ask that all of you who have children and come to the child care, that you would drop them off through the front doors, go to the normal check-in station. If they're nursery age, take them to the nursery. If everyone else, take them to the back to our youth room where we normally meet. And you can pick up at the normal back doors uh, during the pickup time. But we're just trying to, to have our secure check-in and use that more um, during those times. Um, just want to let you know that Pastor Stallmaker and Dina, they're doing well. They're still quarantining. They haven't uh, got any of their results back, whether they had COVID or didn't. But Daniel had it. He's doing well. His symptoms are pretty much all gone. Neither of them have gotten symptoms, so they don't think they have it, uh, but they're trying to be very careful not to spread that if possible. So uh, just please do pray for them as we continue uh, this day. Uh, also, Sunday school starts September 13th, and so we look forward to that. Teachers, you should be getting information uh, shortly, and uh, we look forward to that time of being together during our Sunday school times. Uh, we do have several uh, prayer requests. We'll go through those during our corporate prayer time here in a few minutes. So the youth, or not the youth group, sorry, the worship team, uh, they're going to be helping us worship this morning. Well, good morning, Community Baptist Church. Uh, whether you're here in person or joining us online from home, uh, we're just happy to be rejoicing in the Lord with you today. I just wanted to start by reading um, from Psalm 86. Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Let's uh, stand as we sing together. Come praise and glorify. Sins are washed away, redeemed through sad. 
blessing to be able to sing the praises of a God who can move mountains. And we're going to actually get into a new series this morning about God's miracles and what Jesus did uh, in those miracles in the book of John. And so we're going to see the great power of God at work in real life situations. And the cool thing about it is I'm kind of letting you in on a secret of the message already. The cool thing is, is that those were all temporary things that were done. People raised from the dead, people healed. All of those things were temporary, though. The people that were raised from the dead, eventually they, they did die. And the people that were healed, eventually they died as well. But God is a God who has power not just to save us temporarily, but to save us for eternity. And so we are going to look at that and how we can be confident in his power because of that. And so we look forward to that a little bit later in the message. Um, just three quick announcements and prayer requests. One, uh, thank you all for your prayers. A, a huge praise. The Rulies are able to be back in Morocco, and they're back in their home. That was, if, they had a lot to go through with that, and God brought all of that together and did what we can't do and uh, made himself very powerful in that situation. Um, children are starting school this week, so we want to pray for them. Our last week, some of them the week before, uh, but a lot of people are starting school. We want to pray for our, our school-age children and that God would use them where they are, and that God would continue to grow them, and uh, we look forward to that. And then also our college students, some of them are heading out or already ha have headed out, and so we want to pray uh, for them as they're away, and are some of them who are staying in just a different chapter in their lives, that God would use them, and that God would continue to grow their love for him. So let's pray this morning, and uh, we'll keep Pastor and Dean in our, in our prayers as well. Dear Lord, we do thank you that you have given us the power that we have because of our relationship with you. God, we don't have power in ourselves. We are weak. Lord, we are spiritually weak people. Your word tells us that none of us would ever do good on our own, that we wouldn't have that ability. We wouldn't desire it, and we couldn't do it even if we could desire it. But God, through you, we can please you with our lives. We can see your grace working through us. We can see our lives changed and transformed. And God, we give you all the glory for that. I just think of just the, the people in here, that each of us who have put our faith in you has a testimony of how you've placed your hand on our lives and you've begun to change us. Most importantly, you've changed our eternal destiny from one of judgment to one of peace and eternal, uh, eternal glory with you. God, we thank you for that. We also thank you for just the temporary changes that you're making in our lives. God, I think of so many people here who I've heard their testimony and just, just seeing how what you've done, the power that you have in them, changing them completely from a life that was filled with complete, just whether dissatisfaction with you or just an, an ability to really know you. And God, now they love you. They have a relationship with you and they know someday when they die and they leave this earth that they will be with you for eternity. God, we praise you for that. We don't take that lightly this morning. I pray that as we sing these praises to you, remember what you've done in our lives. I pray that as we hear from your word that we'd remember how much you love us and how much you care for us and how powerful you are and that that would bring us peace, that would bring us satisfaction in you. God, that we pray that you would receive glory by what we do this morning. I think of Pastor and Dina. I pray that you would help them as they continue just to quarantine for the next few days before their two weeks of quarantine will be up. I pray that you'd uh, just even use this time to encourage them, to build them up. I pray that they wouldn't have this virus, that they get back to their normal uh, ways of service for you. I think of the Rulies who are back in Morocco, I pray that you would use them. Lord, I pray that as they transition back, that that would be a quick transition, that they'd be able to figure out, even with the quarantine that's going on there, how they can minister for you effectively. I pray that you'd use them. I pray for their children as they transition back into just a very different um, life than they had while they were here, that you'd give them comfort and peace, knowing that that's where their family is called and just the, the contentment they can have in knowing that they're in your will. God, I pray for our children who are starting school, who have already started. I pray that you would fill them with your peace and your grace in their lives. Or I know some of our children may have never put their faith in you yet, but I pray that you would draw them to you. Even this morning through the lessons, I think of 
our children's workers. I think of our directors and our nursery and our children's ministries. Just the time and the effort and the work that they put in. I pray that you'd bless them for that. I pray that you'd use our teachers as they speak truth through your word to them this morning. That it would become a reality in their hearts and in their lives. God, I know as one who grew up in church, it's easy just to go through the motions. But God, we all need a transformed heart. So I pray for our children that you transform their hearts through salvation. God, I pray for our college students as they are heading back or have already started preparing for classes and some of them who are new to college this year, new to their new environment. I pray, Lord, that you would keep them strong in you. I pray that their relationship with you would grow during this time in their lives, that they would use the opportunities to share Christ with maybe new friends or new uh, classmates or teachers or whatever it might be. I pray that you would uh, just use this time in their lives to truly grow them in your grace, that they would honor you with their lives. God, I pray that this morning we would be able to really just kind of shake off all of the, the things of life that get in our way. Maybe it was the ride to church. Maybe it was even sinful responses to our spouses or to our children. We're frustrated and in a hurry. God, we know that's a reality of our lives, but we ask that you would just calm all of those things in our lives and all of the noise and that we would just be able to focus on you this morning. We thank you for our worship team who gets here early every week and helps us to focus our mind on you as we're in the worship time this morning. Thank you for the songs and, and those who write them and give their lives to writing music that sticks in our heads throughout the week and encourages and challenges us to love you more. I pray that today, again, you would receive all the glory that you deserve. Lord, we need your help to do that, we pray in Jesus' name. The hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest name, but only trust in Jesus' name. Stand and join us. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ
I stand before the throne. Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone. We make strong in the same. scripture reading today comes from John 2, 1 through 11. This is the wedding at Cana. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, but when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Thank you, Sarah. I think with all the singing, I kind of lost track of what I was supposed to be doing. So I just gradually made my way back there. I wasn't supposed to come up yet. And I think I was just excited to get into the message. So thank you, Sarah, for being patient with me. She just looked at me like, are you going to let me do my thing or not? So uh, I appreciate that and for your patience with me. All right. We're in John chapter 2, but we're not actually going to start there. I'm going to have you kind of turn into a few passages. I have the privilege of kind of introducing uh, this series of messages on really, we're, we're looking at God's, uh, really Christ's uh, miracles in the book of John. And then at the end, we're going to kind of branch out a little bit and see a few more in a different passages that aren't in the book of John. And so, um, but this morning, I kind of want to introduce like really what miracles are about. Like why does God have miracles in the Bible and why did Jesus do miracles? What's, what was the point of them and how does that affect us today? Um, Appreciate Sarah Powers who put together um, really all of our designed, uh, all these awesome slides for um, this series and appreciate all the work that people put in behind the scenes. And I try to let people know that there's a lot of people that do a lot for Christ uh, through these things, um, but appreciate that. Uh, Really, we live in a day where um, we're not, I wouldn't say we're easily impressed. Would you say that? I mean, with the internet, you can get on YouTube and see videos and we have social media where people are sending out, hey, did you see this funny video or this incredible thing, right? And I would say because of that and because maybe we've learned that people can Photoshop things, right? So you see something incredible on TV or on a video and I would say sometimes our first response is we're skeptical, right? You ever been skeptical person? You're like, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's right. Um, but we, we tend to be a skeptical people. And that's, that's not all bad, right? Skepticism can kind of, in the right balance, can, can really protect us from things that, that are wrong and that could hurt us as families. And so 
being skeptical is not necessarily wrong, but you have to imagine, like, put Jesus into the first century, and for thousands of years, this Messiah has been prophesied about, right? Through the Jewish people, through the Old Testament, through God's prophet, prophets and prophecies, and, and for thousands of years, and then when he finally comes, you think the people are going to be skeptical? Well, they were. Or whether, you, whether you think they were or should have been, I don't know. But they were, right? The, the religious leaders were skeptical. And we know, looking through the Gospels, that part of that was selfishness. Part of that was they were really, some of them were serving God, not out of a love for God, but really out of, uh, it was a power kind of play. They had power. They had prestige as religious leaders in that community. And so here Jesus comes, and that's really where we're going to pick up the story in, in John. But but really all of God's miracle or all of Christ's miracles in the gospels were there to prove something, right? Because anyone could come and say, I'm the Messiah, right? Anyone could say that. I mean, it doesn't, it's not like you, only Jesus could say those words. Anybody could say that, but how do you prove it? How do you prove it? And how did Jesus use those miracles to prove that he truly was the Christ, the Messiah, and we're going to just look at that this morning. So really our first point, the, the, the series, or the, the title of this sermon is Power to Transform, but that's really not until the second point. This doesn't really have as much to do with that. So we'll get to the first part that's introducing this series. Why miracles? Why did Jesus do miracles? Why did God want him to? And we're going to see in, in, in our passage in John that it was the Father show, like having him do those miracles for a specific purpose. But first, why miracles? The first point of why miracles is that miracles prove to unbelievers that Jesus is God. So we look at Matthew 9. If I'd really encourage you to, to turn there. Matthew chapter 9. We're not going to be there really long. But this really kind of shares with us the heart of Jesus and really the heart of God the Father for people who have, not, who have not followed God yet, have not followed the Messiah, have not put their faith in what God has promised to them, that there would be a Messiah who would come and who would free them from their sin and their condemnation, and they could have eternal life through this Messiah. In verse 1 it says, And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. Again, like we said, anyone could say they're the Messiah, right? Anyone could say they're the promised Christ. This, this Jesus could say it, but anyone could say it. And anyone honestly could say, Your sins are forgiven. How do you prove it, right? Like, you, I can't see in your heart and say, oh, I can tell that their sins are forgiven before God. We can't see that as humans. So the Pharisees kind of have a legitimate point to a degree. And now I, I don't necessarily think their hearts were in the right place, but that was a fair question. Like, how do we know you're the Messiah? How do we know that you can actually forgive sins? Because they knew that only God can forgive sins because truly all of our sin is really an affront to God. It's really us crossing the line of what God has asked us to do and breaking his laws. So if God is the one that we're sinning against, then he's the only one who can forgive our sins. So what Jesus is saying here when he says to this paralytic that let your sins be forgiven, what he's saying to him is that I'm God. That's what they heard, right? Like that's not what we read, but that's what they would have heard in that context. And so for them to push back is, is somewhat reasonable Again, I don't know if their hearts were in the right place, but it's somewhat reasonable question. So Jesus says in verse 4, knowing their hearts, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he arose and went home. See, Jesus, what he did in, in this context, in, in this part of the reason why he did this miracle, was to show those who didn't believe or didn't know if they should believe that he was the true Messiah, someone that they should put faith in because he was all God, even though he was all man. And he said, okay, I understand you can't see whether I'm actually God and whether those sins were forgiven. I get it. But what you're not going to be able to really turn your back on unless you just have a hardened heart is that I'm going to heal this person. I'm going to do a supernatural transformation of this person's body, and only God can do that too. So it's really kind of a, a helpful illustration for all of us 
right? There was a time in your life when you were not a believer in Christ. Maybe someone's here and you're saying, I still don't know if I'm a believer in Christ. And I would encourage you to read through the Gospels and see what Jesus has done in, in these miracles because only God can do the things he did in this world. Only God can do that. So either Jesus is actually God or he's the best magician that's ever been. You really know, there's really no middle ground there. So believing in Jesus is believing in his power because of what he's done. I tell people often when you're speaking to someone about the gospel, maybe someone who hasn't believed in Christ yet, the best thing you can tell them, obviously, is use the Bible. Use God's word because it's powerful. But the next thing is share what God has done in your life. Because I might be able to say to you, if I'm a skeptic of, of Christianity, if I'm a skeptic of Christ, I might be able to say, well, I don't believe that. Or, or I mean, how do I know the Bible is God's word? Fair enough. Those are kind of hard questions to prove. But what people can't say is they can't tell you that what happened in your life didn't happen. Jesus has transformed your life. He's given you peace about your eternity. He's given you purpose in your life. He's given you satisfaction in him. He's changed the way you are. You can't look past that. And that's a miracle that God has done in your life. So share that with people. In verse 8, when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. They knew that this was from God, right? They knew that this was not normal, that no man could have done this. So God showed to these unbelievers at that time that he truly was the Messiah. The second reason why God has sent, gave us miracles through his son, Jesus Christ, miracles prove to believers that Jesus is powerful. See, even as a believer, sometimes we lose hope, right? Like we lose trust. And God wants to show them that there's something bigger than just this world. There's something worth living for. And even sometimes when we lose heart, maybe we lose heart because of ourselves, maybe the sin that's come into our lives and we just keep struggling with that same sin. Maybe it's someone close to us who keeps hurting us and we think, is this ever gonna change? And Jesus shows us through his miracles that he has power to transform, and he has power to change. Jesus' power, um, sorry, not there yet. Jesus' power is really seen in the focus of his miracles. If we look at Luke chapter 10 and verse 17, we kind of see Jesus' idea and his thoughts on miracles by how he corrects his people. So in Luke 10, verse 17, it says, the 72 returned with joy, saying, so what happened is earlier, Jesus sent out 72 of his followers, his disciples, so these were believers in him, and he had them go out and minister. So they came back and they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. So what he's saying is, yeah, you have all this awesome power. But then he corrects them. Because they were like, man, we can cast out demons, we can heal people, we get God's power working through us. And what does Jesus say to them? In verse 20, he says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. See, the focus of Jesus' miracles is not just so that we can be powerful, that we can have strength in us. The point of Jesus' miracles was that he is working in lives. And he's saying, you know what? The power that you have to cast out demons, to heal people through, through my name, it, okay, that's fine, but there's a bigger purpose here, right? The bigger purpose is that believers would be strengthened to go out and share the gospel and that people around this world would see the change in their lives and see what Jesus has done to transform them through his power and that they would accept Christ because the ultimate focus was to save sinners. That's what he's saying. That's the ultimate goal was not so that you look good and can do all these awesome things. The ultimate goal was that you would have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have a relationship with God the Father and you will spend an eternity with him. That was the whole point of the miracles. It wasn't just to be cool. It wasn't just to, to make a big ruckus. It was to get people to know that Christ is the Messiah and they need to put their faith in him. So not only is Jesus' power the focus of miracles, Jesus' power is the purpose of miracles. We look at John chapter 20, 
In just two verses, it says, verse 30, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. He had a purpose. Why are all these miracles not only done, but why are all these miracles written down in the Bible for us? That we would know who Jesus is. There's specific purpose to it, that we would be strengthened in him. And maybe some days when, when we're struggling and we're kind of like, I, I just don't know if I'm going to keep going through this life because it's hard. Keep doing the right thing. Sometimes it's hard. Keep trying to live for Christ can be difficult. There can be setbacks. There can be frustrations. There can be hard times. That anyone who thinks that just coming to Jesus makes life perfect hasn't read the Bible, Right? I mean, you look at the Apostle Paul, and he had a great life from, an, from a temporary perspective of this earth, right? He was powerful. He had money. He had prestige. People listened to him. He was considered one of the greatest religious leaders of his time. And when he changed, when he put his faith in Christ, it didn't make his life better if you look at it from a worldly perspective. It made it worse, right? He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was thrown in jail, Right? All of those things probably never would have happened if he would have stayed the way he was. But the thing that really was important is there was a purpose. And the purpose of his changed life was to show God glory and to have a relationship, with, which is why we were all created in the first place, to have a relationship with our creator, God. So we see why miracles. It's for unbelievers. It's for believers. But it's all about Christ's power to prove who he is, and what he says he is. We're going to kind of take a slight move into an actual um, miracle this morning in John chapter 2. So if you want to turn your Bibles to John chapter 2, now we're actually going to get into the real message. That was kind of an introduction, but this is the real message that we can trust Jesus' power. We can trust Jesus' power. Sometimes we question Jesus' power. To be honest, like if we're just going to be, let's be honest with ourselves this morning. Do you ever have something in your life, and, and the reality is you struggle because you're like, I don't know if this is ever going to get fixed, right? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a spiritual struggle just in your own heart. Maybe it's a sin struggle that you have, um, Maybe it's at work and just that relationship that you have with people and you're just like, God, I don't, I'm trying to do what's right, but they don't want me to do what's right. And this is hard and it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. And we, we question, right? How do we know we question? Because we're not joyful about this uncomfortable circumstance. If we really just believed God all the time, we would be very content in every situation of life. But we struggle. So this morning... We get to look in this passage, and we can see that we can trust Jesus' power because he has the power to transform. So when things don't change exactly when we think they should change, it's not because Jesus isn't there. It's not because his power isn't in working in our lives. It's because he's chosen not to change anything at that point. But we know that there's a purpose behind all that happens in our lives, and we're going to see that through this passage. The first point of this passage is that how we can trust Jesus, Jesus' power is purposeful, okay? So we get into this, this passage as Sarah read this morning, and this is a very well-known passage in the Bible, well-known miracle in the Bible. This is Jesus' first miracle, his first sign that he publicly was the Messiah. He started showing people, but it didn't start out the way that you would probably and I would probably plan your first miracle, right? Because in our culture, what do you do when it's your first of anything? You prepare, right? You prepare, you make like this big to-do about, okay, we're having our grand opening of a restaurant or a store or what, whatever it might be. We make, you know, we make big things. We, we put it like a, do a social media kind of blitz, right? And on every social media, you see this, this store is opening on this date. Why don't you all come out, a big celebration. But that's not what happened here. What happened? Let's start reading in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited into the wedding with his disciples. So this already starts out differently than we would normally start out with our first big miracle, right? If we were able to do miracles, right? We, we wouldn't do it this way. It says like Jesus at this point is kind of like a side note, right? He happened to be invited to the wedding. That's really what it's saying. 
His mom was obviously a part of the wedding, probably in the, the food and the planning here. Uh, but he was like, oh, him and his disciples were invited. They were just normal people invited to this. They weren't the center of attention. They weren't like necessarily considered honored guests. He was just a normal person for, for all intents and purposes for what these people could see. So it already starts out differently. Verse 3, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. So obviously his mother was probably part of, this, of the planning. And, and you have to remember, like running out of wine would have been extremely, uh, like in that culture, it would have been a really bad thing. You'd feel terrible. You also have to remember, to be fair to these people, when they ran out of it, these wedding celebrations weren't like ours, like two or three hours maybe. They were like a week or two weeks long. They would do these huge feasts. So you had to have a lot of planning and, and preparation. And, but running out of, of this wine would have been horrible because it wouldn't just been for like the next hour this is uncomfortable for people because they don't have anything to drink. But this could have been like, we still have a whole nother week to go. <laughs> what are we going to do? Right? And again, it was, it was a just kind of a dishonorable thing to the family. And so Jesus' mother is concerned. And so she, she said, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Okay, so first of all, whenever you study a passage in the Bible, really any, anything, but especially the Bible, you have to go back to the original context. So in our context, if, if a son would say to his mother, woman, okay, that would not go over well, right? Because there is like, there's somewhat of like a, a, just a bad, a bad thing about that in our culture, right? But this was not their culture. Okay, just so you know, this was not dishonorable. This would have just been normal for them to speak this way. He was just talking to his mom and saying, woman, like, here's what's going on. I know even me saying it sounds bad, doesn't it? But I want to just point that out, that we have to read it in the culture it was written in, not in our culture. That's a, that's a big problem when we interpret the Bible in our culture when it wasn't written that. So first of all, let's just get that aside just in case that caused some people to stumble, you know, especially moms. Like Brenda and I were talking about this last night as we were kind of going through some of our small group stuff. And she's like, yeah, if my son would say that to me, it would not go well, right? <laughs> like, woman, no, that would not go well. But this is a different culture. So what does this have to do with me? He says, my hour has not yet come. What does he mean? What's his hour? Really, it's talking here about Jesus was saying up till this point, he's probably about 30 years old, and up until this point, he had lived a life. And, and I, I have to think that people would have, that had been around him would know that he was different than everybody else. Like, he never did anything wrong, right? I mean, that alone would set you quite a bit apart, at least in our culture, and I assume back then as well, right? Like, this guy never, he never says anything mean to anyone. He never talks about anyone like he shouldn't. He's never been disrespectful to his parents. He's never disobeyed them. Like, like, he's not normal. He's not like the rest of us. But he never really proved his messiahship, his, his, that he was truly God up until this point. And that's what he's talking about here when he says, my hour has not yet come. He's saying, my hour, my, my time where I'm going to show people who I really am, when I'm going to show this world that I am the promised messiah and that what, what has been promised to us for thousands of years is actually about to happen, my time hasn't come. And this is kind of an interesting part of the story. I, I'll be honest, I have a lot more questions than answers when we get to here, because in verse five, he says, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you, okay? So I think his mom understands. His mom knows who he is. So that's the answer to the question in Christmas. You know, Mary, do you know? Yeah, she knew, okay? She knew. She knew that he wasn't just a normal Son, he wasn't just a normal boy. He wasn't just a normal man. He knew, she knew that God had sent him as his son to be the Messiah. She knew it. Now, did she know everything? Probably not everything, but she did understand there was a much bigger thing going on here. So when he says, my hour's not come, she says, okay, do whatever he says. I, I, don't, I don't know what his hour is. I don't know what his father's telling him. I don't know any of that, but I know one thing. I know that if he wants to do something here, he can she knew that about her son, that he was not normal, that he had that supernatural power because he was God. The interesting thing about this passage is, what, like, did God use his mother to actually bring out his public ministry? Because he says, it's not my hour yet, but then when we get into the next part of the passage, 
he does it, and it becomes his hour. It's an amazing thing, and we, we don't really know because the, the Bible doesn't really tell us exactly how that works, but, but God used his mother to really bring out that public ministry, and obviously God you know, sanctioned it and told him, yeah, this is the time, but it, it's, it's a neat part of the story how parents, how even, even Christ, even God was still a son on this earth, and his mom's life was working to do the ministry that his father had called him to. So Jesus' power is purpose, purposeful. What's the purpose? The purpose is to do his father's will. Throughout John, over and over and over again, Jesus says, I'm here to do my father's will. I'm here to do my father's will. What is he saying? He's like, I have a, a bigger purpose than just to come and, and take over the Roman Empire and, and free my people. That, that's like, you all are thinking down here. And, and my father, his plan is up here, right? He understands everything, and, and he's doing something that has eternal uh, significance. Not only is Jesus' power purposeful, but Jesus' power is transforming. Verse 6, now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Okay, so what does Jesus do? He tells the people what to do, and they listen, okay? Again, this would not be the way we would do things, right? We would make like a big, we'd want like, I don't know, some kind of fog or, um, you know, like he would do some kind of thing where it would like, boom, like everyone knew it changed. That's not how Jesus worked. And you know, it's interesting because in our lives, is that how Jesus works most of the time? Most of our answered prayer, mo a lot of people may not even know it was answered prayer, right? You were praying for it, and maybe you've been praying for this thing for a long time, and you know, when, when God actually answers that prayer, no one else might even notice, but God's hand was in it, right? We want to see like all the lights and all the fog and all the stuff happen, but when Jesus works, it's not about all the stuff. It's about his power, right? That's the focus of this whole passage, and that's the focus, should be the focus of our lives, that we have the power of Jesus working through us as believers. In verse 9, when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Again, this would have just been a normal thing, right? Just the nature of wine that you would never serve the, like, you'd serve the best stuff. And then as people keep drinking, obviously, like, they don't care as much how much, like, what it tastes like after that, okay? So then you'd kind of, like, work your way down to the less good stuff. But this stuff was better than the original stuff. It tasted better, right? And we don't know all of what that means, but we know it was obvious that it was really good. Jesus, when he does something, He's going to do something really good. That's all he does, right? He couldn't, like Jesus couldn't have made wine and anything less than, than the best. That's what he does. So when he works in our lives, we don't have to worry that Jesus is like holding back on us, right? When things aren't going as quickly as we think they should or as, as the way we planned it out, we don't have to worry about like, well, maybe he doesn't understand what really needs to happen. He does. He's doing the best thing. That's why in the book of James, when it talks about when we're going through hard times, trials, struggles, he says, count it pure joy. Why? Because what he's doing in you, although it seems very like uncomfortable for us, is the best thing for you. Because he loves you as a father. He loves you as, as his child. And he only wants the best for you. But sometimes, in the meantime, it can be uncomfortable. But we look, at these, we look at these stories and we see that Jesus always does the best. And his power only is used for that. And then in verse 11, probably the most important verse in, the, in this passage. And sometimes we get caught up in the miracle and not really the point of the miracle. But in verse 11, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. So this was the first time that he publicly showed like, his, his glory. His power. What does that mean, his glory? And we talk about God's glory a lot. What's the difference? What, what makes God's glory his glory? Is it's, it's different than anyone else or any other being, right? No one else has the glory that God has. No one else has the characteristics and the power and the ability and, and the ability to do everything all at the same time, how exactly he wants it, and for perfection. 
only God can do that. Nobody else without God's power could, could do what Jesus did here. So it was obvious that he was God. When the word manifest, it just means to make clear, to make known. It was obvious to the people at this point that this, this man was not just man, that he was also God. And really this morning, if you're here and you've never put your faith in Christ, that is the truth and the reality of the gospel. That Jesus is all man and all God. And he came to this earth and he died for your sins. And none of us could die for anyone else's sins because we have our own that we deserve to die for. So Jesus came and he's the only person and the only God who could come and do that because of his glory, because of who he was. And he lived on this earth and he, he lived perfectly free from sin. He never at one time had a wrong thought, a wrong action, a wrong attitude. And then he died for our sins. And so when, when Jesus is doing these miracles, he's setting up not just like, oh, follow me, not just, you know, this exciting thing so people follow me. He's setting up really a theology so that people can see his life and be like, how could this, this man who was also God die? Like, why? That doesn't make sense until we understand the plan of salvation, that he didn't die for himself. He didn't even have to die. He died because it was his father's will. He died because it was in the plan for salvation to bring us broken, sinful people who had rebelled against him back to communion and relationship with him and his father. So when Jesus is doing this, he's setting up his father's plan. But then at the end of verse 11, maybe a phrase that we look over often is maybe the most important phrase in this passage. And his disciples believed in him. This isn't talking about salvation because they were already his followers, right? They were already his disciples. So what does it mean they believed him? It strengthened their belief in him. They were like, I mean, we already knew that Jesus was God, but like, you know, when you see something happen, have you ever had that happen in your life? You, you already trust God, but then he does something in your life. He, he answers a prayer. He saves a loved one. He transforms your life in some way. And what do you do? You're like, wow, my, my, my faith in him is strengthened even again, right? He, he helps us. Why? Because God is a God who understands who we are, right? In the Psalms, he says he understands our frame, Okay, and a frame is usually a symbol of strength, but in us, he understands our frame, and spiritually, we're weak. And so he understands how we think. He understands how we doubt. And so God has given us, through his word, these, these miracles to once again prove to us that he's powerful and that he's working in our lives, and he wants what's best for us. And, and if we just put our faith in him and we trust in what he's doing, he'll never fail us. So the, really the point of the story is not that Jesus transformed water to wine. None of the, the earthly things that Jesus did in his miracles are the point. The point of all of his miracles is to prove to us that he can transform each of us eternally. Not just for this world, because that will eventually end, but for eternity. That he can make us new creatures in him. That we can be people who once were doing all of these things that were against him and now we're starting to live for him and love him and care about what he cares about and love what he loves and hates what he hates. All of that we can see through these miracles and this morning we see through the water to wine. So I would just ask you, don't get caught up and no, that was a cool miracle because the excitement of that will, will eventually like kind of just fade away, right? It happened but like in our culture, like you see something really awesome, you go to a show or whatever, and you're like, that was awesome. What happens? A week or two later, you're like, what's the next one, right? Because stuff, things in this world, like it just, it's never gonna keep us up here. But what's gonna keep us up here spiritually is a constant dependence on the power of Christ working in us. Because that doesn't change. It never dwindles, it never gets worse, it never gets unexciting. It's always here. He doesn't drop off. He doesn't lack power ever. He never has a bad day. He's, he's God. And so this morning, I just would challenge us that we would trust the power of Christ to transform our lives and transform the lives around us. I'm just going to look at a few verses at the end. 
verse, uh, John 14, verse 12, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Then he says, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Now, I don't know if you just want to read that. Maybe read it again and understand what Jesus is saying, because it's kind of a tough thing. Like, all of these awesome things that Jesus did, right? And then he says at the end, greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. He's saying that we will get to do greater works than Jesus did. That's what it's saying. And it almost like, that can't be in the Bible, Dan, right? Like, that doesn't sound right. What is he talking about? The, the reality is he's most likely talking about the fact that Jesus came and he did all these miracles, but they were temporary miracles, Right? But the greater thing that he's calling us to do, we're going to see, is, is really the Great Commission. That we get to see people not just temporarily healed, not just temporarily, um, you know, lives change, but that we get to see people eternally transformed for God. And he tells us that we have his power in that in verse Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what do we get out of these miracles? That we have the power of Christ in us. And we might not be able to heal people and we may not be able to, to do all these awesome things, but God says there's actually a higher calling than even healing someone physically. He's saying, going and sharing with them that they can have a renewed and restored relationship with their creator is a much bigger deal. And he says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We don't have to do it ourselves. So this morning, I challenge each of us who are believers here that we go out into our workplaces, into our schools, into our communities, where we live, whatever it, the relationships we have, and we share with people the power of Christ because what he's done in us, because what we see in his word through these miracles, but we share with them the biggest thing, and the biggest thing is that he came and died for their sins, and that simply by faith, they can have that relationship with him and access all of the power that, that comes through that and all of the benefits that come through that. What's easy is on Sunday, we, we see this and we read this and we get, you know, pumped up. And then Monday morning, does, it ever, does Monday morning ever seem somewhat significantly different than Sunday at church? It does for me, okay, I'll, just, I'll be honest. If no one else wants to be, I will. Yeah, it just seems different. But Jesus' power is there. You notice Jesus didn't go, he wasn't at the temple when he did his first miracle, right? He wasn't, he wasn't the center of attention at his first miracle. He was just at a wedding that he happened to be invited to, maybe because his mom was part of the planning committee. I don't like, I mean, really, like, he, he was just invited. And yet his power shone through because it was him. It had nothing to do with the surroundings. He was who he was. He was God. And so this morning, you are a follower of God if you put your faith in him. And the Holy Spirit is indwelling you. And so you have his power working through you. And so even if you feel insignificant or you don't know everything you think you should know about the Bible or you're, you're a timid person, you're not super bold or whatever it might be, when you share the gospel, you don't have to worry about all those things because you have the power of God working through you. And when you live your life for Christ, he will always give you what you need. He will always provide for you in that perfect way might not be the way you think it would happen, but God will always provide for you because he is powerful and he's worthy of our trust. Let's pray. Dear God, we do thank you that you have recorded these words for us. We thank you that you have given us your power through your Holy Spirit indwelling us. God, we know that we still struggle with our flesh as your word tells us but we know that you are more powerful than that. So I pray that this morning, whatever we're struggling with, whatever we feel weak in, whatever we're trying to do for you, but we don't know how we can, God, I pray that we would trust in your power and we would just obey you. Lord, may you use these words to truly bring us contentment and bring us um, an, another level of our faith, another strengthening of our faith in you that you are God who is worthy of our trust because you are powerful, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
service, and I said, why, I'm envious of you. God's going to do something mighty and great because he said, call upon me and I will answer you, I will deliver you, mm-hmm. and you shall glorify me. Mm-hmm. His flight was canceled. He was lonely and gloomed. You all know it. Mm-hmm. But what happened? God intervened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are now in Morocco spreading the gospel right. to Muslims. Yeah. Yeah. That is a miracle. And I just want yeah. to share it. Amen. Thank you. Amen, Pastor Britt. Amen. Yeah. We do serve a wonderful and marvelous God. Um, and if you you do stand amazed, won't you please stand as we sing, I stand amazed. How marvelous. <laughs> 